and we're off. We've got uh, Scott with us today. I'm Andy from Finding Value Finance. We've got Scott from Sow and Reap Capital. Um, we were talking a little bit before about uranium, and the topic that came up was, do you really think uranium is only going to go to $200 a pound? Do you, you really <sighs> think that? And we, we were going back and forth. We were discussing the, you know, we, we were basically looking back at other assets here recently. Uh, Scott was pulling up the NASDAQ. He was pulling up the S&P 500, you know, looking at those types of indices. And he's going, well, you know, if you compared it to previous highs, uh, these things you would have sold out like before the big move even came. And when we yank those charts up, I mean, they just had massive moves and I'm sure he'll show that. But Scott, why, why do you think that, you know, $200 is just, it just seems too low or a hundred, hundred to two hundred dollars. I mean, a lot of people spout that out. It's you get in this echo chamber of 150, 100, 200. Basically, the last all time high is roughly what a lot of people think, or slightly higher than the all time high of last time. What makes you think yes. that uh, this time uh, is going to actually be the same and not different like other people think? So, I'm what I'm saying is if this bull market went to 150 or 200, well, that would actually be different. Uh, and what Scott's arguing is for what it hap what happens in other markets, which would be the same, where we blow out of those highs and get a new uh, all-time absolute, we'll call it the absolute high uh, adjusted for inflation and adjusted for other measurements. So what, why yes. do you think that, Scott? Why I do mean, you think we're not going to stop? I mean, if, if, it, if it only goes to 150 to 200, then it means, I think, in my opinion, it will be the worst uranium bull market in history. So if you look at the 1970s run, if you look at the 2000s run, obviously inflation adjusted is 200 bucks. But I mean, we've got, I mean, I don't know if you can just rely on the CPI. As you know, it, it's a CPI lie, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. let me just take you to IXIC's chart. So NASDAQ chart. So what, I, what I'm thinking, in my opinion, right, calling for, two, uh, calling for uranium to go to 200 is like saying, this is NASDAQ um, 2007. We're sitting around 28,850, uh, right? I think calling for uranium to go only marginally above the 2007 high is like saying NASA can only go to this side here because it went to the highs of 2,800 here. But what did it do? It went from around, let's say 3,000, let's make it an even number, and it went all the way above 15,000. So NASDAQ, if you look at the NASDAQ alone, from 2007 high, to the 2021 20, uh, high, it did 5x, right? It did more than 5x. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and the reason for that is really simple. How much money is there in the system to chase assets, basically? So if you look at um, M2 money supply, for example, and if we just draw a line here, which is when approximately, let's say 2007, seven, somewhere around 2007, we had $7 trillion, just above $7 trillion in money supply, M2 money supply. Right now, we've got three times that amount. So that literally means we've got three times the, the amount of currency chasing all these assets. But Andy, we've talked about this many times. It's not just the asset, the, the, the empty money supply chasing these assets. It's also the combination of bond market selling off. We haven't seen bond markets being literally like a secular bull market for 50 years or so, right? For 40 years. From 1980, the peak, peak interest rate was at in 1980 where Fed funds was around 18%. And then we were in a bull market until pretty much now. The trend is changing in that, which means the money's going to flow out of it and it's got to find a place to go. Same with the general equities. Now we've been in a bull market since 2008 or 2009 to 2021, and the money is starting to flow out of it. And maybe we'll just go sideways. I don't know. I'm not bearish um, general equities. I'm not bullish general equities. I'm just neutral. I wouldn't be surprised either way. Um, I wouldn't be surprised with a sideways move. I wouldn't be surprised with a with a panic sell off in general equities. But we have so on top of the M two money supply, we have market conditions that are just unbelievably ripe for commodities right now. In that money's pulling out of bonds, money's potentially pulling out of general equities. You've got um, real estate, for example, which are sensitive to interest rates, and in a rocketing interest rate environment, I don't know if you'll see a similar real estate. 
upward trajectory movement, specifically in countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, like we did in the 1970s. In the 1970s, it wasn't a, the, the mortgage market or the housing market wasn't leveraged as it is now. People, a lot of people bought their houses with the cash uh, and it was considered hard asset and, and, and a store of value. Um, but in this day and age where every well, a lot of people are leveraged, I don't know if it will attract the same amount of capital to the housing market. So ultimately, you've got potentially four biggest markets, right? Bond market, general equities market, the housing, the real estate market, three biggest markets, where money will flow out of those markets and potentially into commodities. And I, for me, it's all about it's all about money flow because, and the reason why I said that, Andy, we discussed it before, but. I mean, in uranium, for example, in previous bull markets, I mean, did we really have fundamental uh, fundamentals that should have dri driven the uranium prices higher? The answer was kind of no. Like, if you look at the 1970s bull market where uranium went absolutely berserk, we had huge inventory buildup and huge uh, surplus of production. <laughs> and uranium price still went berserk, right? And that was just mm -hmm. along with all the commodities because it was part of the commodities complex. And because it, we had uh, peak oil in 1970s in the United States, for example, and the demand for energy and the fear of running out <clears> and, and, and the discovery of um, the nuclear power and potentially looking forward and going, yes, we might have a lot of nuclear power going forward. That's what drove it. The supply demand picture didn't drive it. Um, we didn't have any fundamentals that should have driven uranium markets back in the 1970s as we should, uh, as we should see today. Yet we still saw it. And, and same with 2000, we just had the Cigar Lakes um, incident, but we still had demand and supply, which is imbalanced compared to today, right? Um, and, and we still had inventory build up back then as well. So I feel like, I mean, uranium market at 100 to, uh, to 150 to 200, I, I think that's just way, way underestimating what's to come. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll interject and throw some of my opinions in here as well. Um, the, the way that I view markets, you know, as I look at them more and more and more and the way that I kind of study these things is it's a, it's about money flows. And what really needs to happen is people need to, I'll say, get burned. They have to lose money for them to rotate money out of it. Uh, there's no reason that a fund manager, an institutional investor or something, if they're making money, why would they move? that money out of whatever they're in. So they basically need an incentive or or a, a feedback loop from the market saying, look, this isn't an asset to be in. You're going to get punished. And then it goes down. So right now, um, we are looking at stocks being punished, bonds being punished, and people are going to say, I can't be in these assets if they continually punish me for quarter after quarter after quarter. And it has to be a continual punishment. It's not a quarter or two. It needs to be continual for a while. And then if they're getting punished for three quarters, four quarters, five quarters, it's over a year now. <clears throat> and there's other assets that are establishing good track records, like oil for a year or two or three. Other assets that are establishing good track records, uh, they're, they're starting to stabilize and get positive years, year after year after year. I think you're going to see that money literally rotate, travel through the dollar, the dollar may get strong and then that dollar will get weaker as it goes into other assets. But I know a lot of people, they really look at the sector itself. They look at the fundamentals, 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 fundamentals. The thing I'll ask you, Scott, and everyone else that's viewing this, I'm gonna ask you this question. Has uranium ever gone up massively outside of a commodity bull market? And then the answer is going to be no. And then my question is, why hasn't it? Have you ever seen copper solo vertical without the other commodities going up? Has has oil gone up in by itself and not brought you know brought up precious metals with it and other commodities? Why do they all move together? That's the question that you should be asking and solving. Why do these things move together? This is what I solved when I created the thesis and when I went and looked at all this data. I said, well, why are these all moving together? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, at least my opinion and how I view it. Money is going to flow where it's going to get a return. 
and money's going to leave where it's being punished. The question isn't which uranium guys are going to, to beat over their head the fundamentals. It's not about the fundamentals of uranium. It's about the people who know nothing about uranium that have a bunch of money and they say, I can't leave it in bonds and I can't leave it in stocks. Where should I put it next? Then they'll say, these are losers. These are potential winners. They're going to do a little bit of research in them. And then they're going to say, I want to go into copper, uh, uranium, and natural gas. I don't know, whatever they they decide to go into. So it's it's not about the the people and the fundamentals and, and all of those things. And I, and I agree, the fundamentals are great. I'm not arguing that they're bad. I think what people are missing is that they're not thinking about the people who aren't in it that are going to be in it because that's where all the big money's at. Money has to be agitated to move. If they're getting a return, they're just going to leave it there. So what's happening is they have to be punished quarter after quarter after quarter, and then eventually they're going to start to move over. It just takes time. And it's going to be very volatile. Uh, you're going to get burned a couple of times. At least that's what it's going to feel like if you're a new investor. I'm not a new investor. I'm like psychologically beaten down before many times where a 20, 30, 40, 50% pullbacks like ah, I've been through this quite a bit. I buy on these big pullbacks. So you get the low cost, you know, basis. I'm not chasing the price up. That's how you protect yourself. You, you protect yourself by not chasing. You buy when it's low, at least the way that I'm doing it and the way I'm describing, not advice. I'm buying it low. Buy on the pullbacks when things start to turn around and I just feed in money across all these different assets. So it's, I know a lot of people focus on the fundamentals of the, of the sector that they're looking at. You got to look bigger than that. This is kind of a big picture view macro type investing. It's, and it's, it's going to take time. It's not going to be 30 seconds. You're in and you're out. Uh, sometimes they go ballistic right after you buy it. It can happen. You could buy it now and all of a sudden you got a 10, 20, 30 bagger on your hands in a year or two. Sometimes they do that when the markets are ripe. And what we're trying to do is just catch a couple of these things. So, you know, I don't know if that's your experience, Scott. I don't know if I described it well enough. I mean, that's kind of how I view it. But uh, what's what's your viewpoints around that? Do you agree or disagree or? No, I agree. I agree. I think I think basically this is a time to be accruing. Um, I think we still haven't seen parabolic moves yet. And all asset classes that I've seen so far ends in parabolic move, whether it be the tech sector, whether it be the just normal um general equities in, in consumer goods and services, for example, anything, anything that starts a bull run normally ends in parabolic moves. And what we haven't seen yet in the in the uranium sector is that we've started going up. We're we're in a steady rise. Um, we're we're starting this bull market, and that's quite mm -hmm. obvious. If you look at um chemical corporations, if you look at URA, URA, for example, um, it's very obvious that we started the bull market. But what we haven't seen yet is the parabolic move, and it's coming. <laughs> it's definitely coming, I think. But you know, we we don't know if it's going to go sideways for a bit longer. Um, we don't know if it's going to take off tomorrow. But all we can do is. Just based on the based on the chart, look for look for the pullbacks, get in, get in when it's shape, as Andy said, and just sit sit tight and just wait for, for the big tidal wave to come along because I think it will come for sure. Yeah, another another thing that I noticed when I looked back in history and was looking at some of this data, um, I, I don't I didn't really see a I mean, we saw some movements with the deflationary type collapse of the real estate kind of coming down. Uh, then we came back up. We came back up usually to a much lower high than what we did in the previous bull market run. Um, I was looking at the 10 year and 30 year yields as a ratio. And I was trying to compare all these markets with that ratio and when they were kind of moving, trying to see if if the 10 year and 30 year were going up, what were the assets doing? And if it was going down, what were the assets doing? Uh, under a um, expansionary phase of real estate, which is inflationary, because that was the main driver in history, not this printed money that they just threw out in the market and, and did this one big experiment with. But what I, what I noticed is that we got the big moves all together. And 
I don't think people who are waiting for a crash and were to buy after the crash will necessarily get that big move because we just haven't seen that in history. The big moves happen before the deflationary crash. The driver was the real estate market and that credit expansion and loaning into the system. Um, the tough part about the 1970s is it went up, it pulled back, and then we went up again. But the demographic did the same thing. It went up, pulled back, and then went up again. Uh, so I don't know what's difficult when looking at the data and looking backwards is, you know, that demographic movement, was that a direct correlation to the M2 money supply movement? Tough to say. And I don't think interest rates are driving this. I think that interest rates are a backseat driver. So the, the Fed is saying that they're raising rates, but the rates are already raised. They're just doing whatever the market's doing. So when people say, oh, just wait for this, um, these interest rates to crush the market, it's a deflationary type movement. My answer to that is the interest rates are that high because of the market conditions forcing them there. The question that I would like to ask, and, and, and this is to everyone, if you guys have answers, put it in the comment section. The driver of the previous inflationary movements was uh, the housing market. This time around, it doesn't look to me like the housing market's the sole adder to this, this, this movement. Um, I think there's secondary things going on behind the housing market. And as these inflationary pressures come in, and the, 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 the question is, what is the driver of this inflation? And is that driver going to continue to inflate? That is the, the, the million dollar or $10 million question. Because I, if, they can, if they continue to raise rates, and we hit some sort of problem. The markets are going to not like this. The, the stock market's going to go down. Bonds, I mean, they're already selling off. That's kind of one of the, the leading drivers why interest rates are going up. If something is driving this where, at least in my opinion, the banks are not convinced that this is going to be a deflationary collapse. Why do I say that? Because interest rates keep going up. The, the driver is still there and the banks think that the driver is still there. That's why interest rates continue to go higher and higher and higher and higher. So what is, at least in your opinion, Scott, what do you think is driving this? And you may or may not have an answer. If you guys have answers out there, definitely put it in the I've comments. Got, I've, got, I've got a very strong but, thought around this, actually. Um, so, so <clears throat> yes, you're 100% right. That used to be the housing market that drove inflation higher. I think it's the expansionary phase. And, but, but we've talked about this many times where I think it's, way different this time and i think it's way more bullish for commodities this time around specifically to start off with energy and food and mm -hmm. and the reason why i say this is i keep coming back to this we have not seen anything like this in history where people this is households and non-profit organizations checkable deposits and currency i've shown this many times we have not seen such a high cash balance ever in history what does this mean if you've got housing market, and if you're talking about the expansionary um, phase of the real estate, right, it's hard to, um, <clears throat> the only time that you will get cash in your hands is when you sell off your housing. The, the other stuff that dri drives the commodity market during an expansionary phase is obviously the input cost that goes into building the houses. Um, and, and it will be, I think, commodities that are outside. Well, you, obviously, you've got energy costs, you've got you know, food costs and everything else. But the things that drive the housing market, the commodities that the housing market drives will be typically your base metal, your copper, um, iron ore, um, lumber, all those things, right? So I think back in the 1970s and back, and back in the 2000s, you've seen very strong markets in those sectors. Whereas this time around, relatively speaking, you haven't, seen re you haven't really seen iron ore take off. You've seen lumber briefly take off, but it's come down quite a bit. What I think will happen because of the excess cash that they have, um, it's all about how that money is going to be spent, right? So once again, you pay for housing, what, what, what are you going to do with it? You're going to live in it. You're not necessarily going to liquidate and convert into real money because as soon as you liquidate, you're probably going to buy another house. That's how the housing market works. So all the money, the flow of money, when you had monetary policy that created that expansion in the housing market, or if you had demographic, demographic that created that expansion phase in the real estate market, 
I think that's where money went into commodities very indirectly into those base metals, into lumbar, into those things. Whereas now, what we're seeing now, I think we have never seen anything like this before. We, we've got, imagine Andy, you've got 50 <laughs> times more cash in your bank account. What do you do with that money? You're unlikely to go out and buy copper. And, and we're talking about Peter Lynch's idea again. Look at where your, uh, you know, look at your wallet to see where your money's going and then invest in that sector. So right now, where are we spending most of our money? If we have a lot of cash, right? And if the prices of everything is going up, in terms of, in, in, uh, in percentage terms, we'll be spending way more on energy. Europe's like, you know, their, their, their bill has gone up from something like, uh, I've seen, I think in, in Germany or something or some other country, like 150 euros to 500 euros per month. And now it's like 15% of the uh, disposable income or something like that. Something, cra some crazy number spent on energy, right? I'm paying a lot more in electricity. I'm paying a lot more in petrol. I mean, obviously the SPR release has helped with the petrol prices for the time being, um, but that's that's going to be uh, that's going to end soon. But if you actually think uh, the food prices have gone up dramatically, right? So I was um, I've got this favorite sashimi place, for example. Um, I think towards the end of last year we were paying eighty something bucks uh, for a, for a large sashimi set. When I went this time around, it was $130 for the same thing, right? Pizza place, end of last year or even beginning of this year, I was paying 40 something bucks for a family meal. This time I went, it was like $65. So you're spending, and if I go to the grocery store, for example, everything's gone up in price. And why is that? I think Australia also has higher cash savings rate. Oh, well, not cash savings, but higher amount of cash in the uh, checkable deposits because of COVID, because... People didn't spend money. Um, uh, they didn't go out. They were receiving free money from the government, right? It's the helicopter job. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you you have high cash levels all around the world right now. And where is that money going to go? Like, it's not going to go into buying a house outright. You're not going to be building anything. You're not going to be spending money on iron or indirectly spending your money on iron or copper or anything like that. The, the most sensible place where it's going right now is energy and food. And on top of that, the thing that's going to drive this to an insane price level is not only the liquidity, the, the free money in, in, um, in the checkable deposits and so on, but it's really the shortages of everything, right? So you've got energy crisis right now where we are literally short oil, gas, uranium, coal, everything else. <laughs> you've got food crisis now where um, uh, Ukraine and Russia used to produce 30% of world's wheat or something. They also the same amount of fertilizer, twenty percent of fertilizers or something like that, and fertilizer will lead to food shortages coming going forward. <laughs> so, so you've got huge. I mean, we've talked about supply demand and why it might not matter, but these are I think huge tailwinds. If you've got limited supply, um, in a commodities bull market where you've got so much money out there, I think it's gonna be a huge like wave tide, tidal wave of everything lining up. Everything, absolutely everything lining up for a huge commodity super cycle. Um, and, and to start it off with, I think, as I said, it's going to be, um, it's going to be energy first, I think, this year. Let, let's look at, I mean, let's look at, let's look at CCJ seasonality and let's look at. Here's a question I have for you, though. You said the yes. checkable deposits. If you were to pull up that chart again, I got a question for you on it. If you notice the checkable yes. deposits went up quite dramatically after 2010 is from what i saw it's still even after there it went up quite dramatically why didn't we see a large amount of inflation after 2010 to 2018 in that type of it's the velocity of money i think i think it's velocity of money so mm -hmm. so you might have a lot of checkable deposits you might have the people might have a lot of savings in their accounts but mm -hmm. that money needs to come out so it's like it's like Check, uh, money under the under the mattress theory, right? So if you keep all your money in your checkable deposits or under your mattress and you don't spend it, that has no effect on inflation until people come out and panic. So if you start panicking about food, for example, if you start panicking about energy and you want to store it up, you know, like, I mean, in Germany, for example, if you're looking for firewood, who knows, you might, you know, if we see very high petrol prices after the strategic petrol uh, SPR release is over, like you might see people um, try and get like tins, like petrol tins or whatever, and like store more petrol in your houses. Who knows, right? So 
the money has to come out and money needs to rotate within the system for there to be an inflationary pressure that comes from additional creation money. If you can, I can create literally 10 times more money, but if everyone's storing that money in your checkable deposits and not going out there and spending it, then you're not going to drive inflation. But I think that what's different this time around, on top of those things, I think these checkable deposits also meant, I mean, we've seen stock prices go up, we've seen bond prices go up. You know, in, in an environment like in 2008, um, after the financial, uh, or before the financial crisis, for example, you've had still quite a lot of money being printed. But where did that money go? It went into the housing market, real estate market, right? So where there are asset classes that you can, um, you can get into with the additional money that you have, it could drive up asset prices. Whereas this time around, I think it's different. It's going to go into, uh, so, so with the checkable deposits, for example, you might have, people might have used that as a, um, as a deposit for, to purchase a house and take out new loans, in which, which means it might have gone to the housing market, for example, right? But now I think it's going to go into food and energy um, because we've got so much money. People are probably struggling. I've got, I've got a few workmates now coming up to me and telling me about how they're struggling with mortgage payments here in Australia um, because it has gone up dramatically. I mean, if you look at the mortgage repayments in Australia and they were up to the neck even before the interest rates went up, like it is, it is a real struggle. I've got like family members selling off their uh, investment homes right now as well because they can't afford to pay the interest rates. So you're seeing signs and you're talk we, we are right now talking about a situation where with the excess money you have, you can't go into bonds because you'll be losing money. You don't, you don't want to be going into the share market because everyone's feeling nervous about the share market. You can't really go into real estate because the cost of borrowing is so high. And the only place that money can go, literally, is the commodity sector. That's what and I think. And precious metals too, yep. Precious metals well, I, too. I think my take on it and, and the way that I view it is they created all that money that they recapitalized the banks after the, the great financial crisis of 2008. They recapitalized the banks. And what the banks did, in, in my opinion, is they, they, they took that money and put it in the stock market and bond market. And they had all that money kind of hid in those uh, areas. And the, the reason I know that is because if you do ratios and you look at the asset versus asset, you can see everybody piled into stocks and bonds and commodities were at 100 year lows. And uh, you could easily tell where the money was at using the ratios and, and comparing it to history. And what I think is scaring them is that if that money starts to rotate differently, there's so much money in those assets. And if both of those assets aren't, aren't working, people are going to rotate those assets out of stocks and bonds and put them into commodities and potentially uh, precious metals but the problem with that is people can see that and and what that's going to do is they're going to see it in the consumer price index so all the money that was created beforehand and got pinned into those assets is now coming out of those assets because they're not going to work anymore and it's going to take a couple quarters or a year or two of them not working and then that money is going to start to continually rotate into the stuff that's working and the stuff that's going to be working is going to be seen by the consumer price index, unfortunately. Energy, food, and I think some of these metals will do very well, precious metals and all this other stuff. And we haven't seen this type of rotation since the 1970s. So we've been in a 40-year bull market in bonds and stocks with a declining interest rate environment. We've seen the breakout on that interest rate come up of that 40 years. And now I think that the Federal Reserve is scrambling because they, they, they don't want the money to rotate or maybe they do, I don't know. They, they're, they're trying to like pause this and, and get and this money's gonna rotate into stuff that, that, that basically everybody can see through the consumer price index. They're saying, well, what's all this? It's going up ridiculous, you know, 18, 20% uh, year over year. And that's where even I get a little bit concerned because now you're playing with, you know, the psychology of things. 
you know, if people start cracking, they're like, ah, I'm out of dollars. Just, you know, I'm done. And then they, they transact into something else and they start getting that velocity to kick up. Then I'm like, wow, this is, this is going to get a little bit ridiculous if too many people start running out of the dollar or if they start running out of everything. So, um, you know, another thing that's tied to all of this is uh, I think Russia is timing their attack against other countries, the Europe against Europe and uh, America. I think they're doing this on purpose and they're doing it uh, at a time where you could have problems with debt and currencies. So I think if you if you if you choke the energy uh, at a time where people are high, you know, countries are highly in debt, and they printed a bunch of money. I mean, maybe we're going to like moonshot the interest rates up because there's a reason to do it. They need to protect the dollar. So they're we're, we're literally going into a currency crisis or currency war with other countries and people just don't really know it. And there's going to be benefactors of that war, uh, currency, you know, crisis or war. And maybe, you know, energy is going to be one of the benefactors. Uh, the things that people, I think, or countries are going to start looking at is the security of energy. And they're going to be looking at how can we build out our grids and be more robust with the delivery of the system. And that just screams to me that you're going to have some massive nuclear build out. Uh, because I don't think anything else can really fill that gap um, as well as nuclear can. I think you can put some renewables in, but it, it's just too, um, we'll call it, uh, it varies too much. It's, it's, it's not a stable base load power. So you, you have to anchor it with something. And I think that's something, something's going to be nuclear just for the fact that uh, it's, it meets all of their, their requirements that they have created. And they're going to do it because they have to do it. It's not because they want to do it. Uh, they're going to have to do it because their currencies are going to implode if they don't, <laughs> if they don't get this energy and, and they don't, they can't grow their production and stuff. So I don't know. That's been my kind of take on it. What's uh, what's your take, Scott? Do you think, you know, are you thinking on those lines or you got a different mindset or, or what? I mean, you don't have to agree with what I say. It's okay to, <laughs> to disagree. That's exactly what I think. And that's exactly what I think. Um, yeah, so the nations, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as you talk about, Andy, um, basically power, your electricity and your energy is what drives GDP. So mm -hmm. if you think about a country like, you know, China, for example, like, I mean, people talk about how you, no one's going to pay like 200, over 200 pound, uh, $200 per pound of uranium. But I'm like, but how about if you can get like, I mean, if you if you look at a country like China, they produce goods, right? So they, they're... A producing uh, producing nation and so if they don't have power it means effectively all their gdp is gone so that that's not the way that anyone's going to look at it like not there's not a nation in the world that would just go oh, okay the uranium price is too expensive we can't afford to pay it the the thing is if you don't have uranium if you don't have nuclear power you're not going to be able to produce anything and sell anything right um so and that will just drive the economy down. Like if you look at a nation like Australia, for example, obviously we're not going to be spending a whole lot more. Um, we're not going to be using as much electricity as someone like China uh, for, for production purposes, because obviously we're very heavily dependent on, dependent on natural resources and mining. But I mean, if we don't have energy, if we don't have oil, diesel, you know, <laughs> who's going who's gonna to dig stuff out of the ground? You just simply can't. Um, and even the work that we do, Andy, I, I don't know what, uh, I don't know if you get to go, I mean, go out to manufacturing facilities or anything like that, but I spend most of my time in front of a computer. So if I don't have a computer, like, what are we going to do? Are we going to write everything down on a piece of paper? And like, if we're going to photocopy, I mean, do we need to go back to a time where we stamp everything and then like distribute it like through, you know, manual white papers and things like that? Like, I mean, we, I mean, without energy, you can't, you can't. You don't. You have zero production, basically. So, um, that I mean, the price of uranium, um, will be infinite in an environment where the nations don't have energy. So, the the way that I look at it is, uh, I think I did the calculation once, and I shared it on. I actually shared it on the channel. If you look at the old one, every penny increase in the end user, so it's a penny per kilowatt hour is equivalent to $213 a pound of uranium. 
And if you look at current energy prices uh, in around the world, we we ours I think ours is around fourteen cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, Germany's is like way up there. We're talking like triple, quadruple what we've got. So what that means is their energy price right now, what that they're charging for electricity. If if I can get electricity for 14 cents an hour roughly and they're doing it for like 40 50 cents an hour uh for that gap to come down from them or or for me to go up to that level of where they're at i mean 10 cents is two thousand dollars a pound it's two thousand one hundred and thirty dollars a pound is what my calculation was so i'm not saying that that's going to necessarily go to that price i don't know what the price is going to go to I'm just saying that they're already paying way more than they would having nuclear power plants and and paying a thousand dollars per pound of of uranium and having the output of that end user get that electricity. It'd be cheaper to do that than it is to pay what they are right now. So I, I think there's a big amount of room to grow in that in that electricity price uh, for uranium to provide base load power at cheaper prices than what they currently are at. Uh, I also think that uh, we've got a lot of inflation in the system and we are pricing these things using dollars. Um, so if you were to look at historical uh, calculations, when you start taking the dollar values out of things and you start looking at how things were priced against each other, uh, asset versus asset, uh, I think uranium in a normal bull market could easily hit four or $500 and be a at a normal um, valuation. Uh, when I did those calculations in the past, um, if you took the bottom of the bull market of gold and you took the top of the bull market of gold and you calculated where it hit it in that entire run, so the, the low and the high, as it goes up, we hit it about 38% on average uh, of that move going up of gold. So if gold, and 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 we could get major ranges here. If gold goes to 10,000, we started at 2,000. And that difference is 8,000. It, it's about, it's about 36, 37% of that move. And then you add it to the base level. So think of it as something like, uh, let, let's just say like, $4,200 or something like that, uh, 5,000, somewhere in that range. And then F of 5,000, you want to divide by uh, what I found is maybe about four, five or four is a pretty good number. Uh, so if it's 5,000 divided by five, that gets you to a thousand dollars a pound uranium. Uh, that is if historically we match what it's done in history. And, and basically all that is is an inflation adjusted commodity bull market run. That's all it is. It's not me saying or trying to be profound here and say like, this is some ridiculous number. It, it's just, if history were to repeat itself and the valuations were to be somewhere in that range. Now, maybe gold doesn't get to 10,000. Maybe it only gets to 5,000 and that price of gold is much lower. Maybe it peaks out at 3,000. And then if you divide it out, uh, what's that at? What's 3,000 divided by, say, five? And that would be what, like six, 600, 600 yeah, $600 is, uh, yeah, $600 is what it would be. So maybe it's $600. I don't know. Uh, I don't have the crystal ball and to, to, to know what all these assets will necessarily be priced at. Uh, but I can tell you that we've got enough money in the system where gold could do some crazy things. Now, here's another thing. I'm just going to keep, I'm going to kind of build on this. Um, I think that the powers at B, the, the, the Federal Reserve banks, the governments and all that stuff, everything that I kind of measure off of is to the price of gold. And a lot of people do that. They say, well, what is the gold price doing? They're looking at gold for signals. And they might be in there messing with gold and the price of gold. And everything is kind of indexed to that price of gold. So, um, I don't know if they're in there actively doing anything. I can't, I don't know for sure. 
I'm not necessarily saying that they're outright manipulating it and, and maybe they can or cannot control it, or maybe we're just early. But at some point, if money starts to rotate into it, everything's going to get repriced higher with it uh, to some extent. And right now, gold has not accounted for hardly any money supply. We are very, very low. So I think that's a really good opportunity to look at is these precious metals because they they haven't accounted for anything yet. Um, one thing that makes me think that they may not be manipulated on a long term basis I said not, is I don't know if the market conditions are there yet. Uh, usually we get this compression in the 10 and 30 year yield that I've been kind of looking at where the 10 and 30 year yield, when it does certain, if it goes a certain way, precious metals kind of hold off until it's going to turn and come back down. I'll show Scott what that, you know, what that is uh, later, but, and how they're all correlated because I've been looking at it much more so these days. But I think, we're very close to that turn. And it's basically, if I were to describe it, it's the yield curve inverting. And it's either, you know, going like this, it's flattening and inverting. This is the short-term rate here, short-term rates. Once it inverts and it's, once it stop inverts and then starts going back to normalizing, that's when precious metals go ballistic. That's when it goes ballistic all the way until this curve goes back to normal is where I've seen that, that, that movement. So we are basically at a very good level historically to pick up these metals. And yeah, we might be in it for a year or two, but it's going to be glorious when this thing turns around, whenever it does turn around. I can't tell you the turning point. Whenever it does turn around, maybe it's a couple of years out. It's going to be absolutely glorious. It's going to be absolutely ridiculous. And maybe, maybe it turns around in the next month or two. And I think what was happening, and, and this is just my opinion here, is People thought the curve was going to normalize with lower inflation numbers of the CPI. And I think it surprised some people that said, well, this inflation is kind of sticky. It's not going back down as much as we thought. And then you get that knee jerk reaction. But I mean, we'll see where it goes. I'm still uh, in the hyper bullish camp in precious metals. And I will be until this thing plays out, irrespective of what the short term does. But um that's kind of what I've noticed over over the years here and me kind of continuing to re continuing to refine what is going on around me and how I can find correlations. Uh, I do think that curve does mean something to a, a lot of people that allocate money. So what else do you have, Scott? Anything else? Yeah, just going back to uranium, mm -hmm. um, you've talked about the money supply and you've talked about the gold as a measure. But mm -hmm. for me, I would... The most important, my, my base case for this uranium bull run is this. So this is a UX1, um, which is the uranium futures market divided by M2 money supply. So for me, this is the base case that we will at least reach the highs we've seen in 2007 because the fundamentals are much better back in 2000 uh, than, than right now than it was back in 2007. So relative to the money supply, I think we will see at least it come up to this level, which gives you about 8.4 times the current price. So we're sitting around, what, $50? That gives us $420 uranium price. And that is not taking into account the better fundamentals for uranium right now than it was back in 2007. This is only just accounting for the amount of currency out there. And so the reason why I think that works really well is if you look at SPX divided by M2 money supply, I mean, a lot of people here might have gone, if you just looked at SPX straight, a lot of people might have gone somewhere around here. Oh, this is not, um, <clears throat> hold on, let me just put a compare. So on the, put it on the new pane. So we reached in SPX relative to 2007, the highs around this level. A lot of people might have gone, just looking at this chart alone, people could have argued um, and, and it might have sounded logical. People might have argued that this was the greatest bubble of our lifetime because we had the housing market um, bubble. bubble. Um, and then they might have said, just uh, uh, around this level, or oh, no way it's going to go higher than the 2008 level because, because this was the greatest bubble. We're not going to repeat that bubble again. So a lot of people might have sold out here. What I'm trying to say here is if you just, if you just without taking into market consideration, market conditions, if you, 
if you just rely on what it's done historically in nominal terms without looking at the overall market conditions, you could you could be the biggest, you could have the biggest knowledge base of uranium out there. And you could have invested super early, but you could be one of the earliest exiters missing out on the entire bull run that was to come after that. Look at that. Look at how much it ran afterwards. So what I'm trying to say is SPX, if if this was the top, did at least come up to the um top here relative to money M to money supply. And I think I expect to see no less than you your uranium price divided by M to money supply come up to the previous highs here. And the one thing That's I what? will say here as well is the N2 money supply continually grows with time. Yeah. Yeah. So in the in that term, if right now it needs to go up 8.3 times or 8.4 times to hit what the money supply is today. But the money supply in two or three years at the rate these guys are going, who knows what it's going to be? It could be another 10, 20, 30 percent of the entire money supply. And and going back to the S and P five hundred that you had there with the M two money supply, what you're looking at is the psychological thresholds. That ratio up top is the psychological thresholds of what the market basically will price itself given the money supply. That's what that ratio is. So in two thousand seven, we were we were basically as expensive today in twenty twenty two as we were in uh, two thousand seven. That was the same thing. Now, if you back out, does it have the ninth, the 1999, 2000, 2001 peak? Well, there's the peak way up yes, there. That is the ultimate peak uh, of oh, look at this line. pricing in relationship. Yep. Yep. Lots this of uh, resistance there. Yep. You know, and there's a possibility if they start to really start to throw money out there, that stocks may go back up. And, and yeah. what we saw in the hyperinflation in Germany, and I'm not calling necessarily for hyperinflation, but, you know, if you see stocks starting to run and they usually run first, um, we've seen that in hyperinflations where the value of stocks go down against other assets, but the, uh, but the nominal price goes up through the roof. And I think that's probably what they're going to try to do is they don't want this to fall in nominal terms, so it's going to fall in terms of its value. So when I say there's going to be a crash, or if I think there's going to be a crash, they're going to say, well, everyone's looking at the nominal value for that crash. I'm saying it's going to buy a whole bunch of less other stuff. That's all. That's where it's going to yes. get hit. The value of that stock, even though the price of it goes up, the value will go down. And that's where all of Almost everyone that you look around, Twitter, YouTube, on and on and on and on. I don't think they understand what I just said there. They know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I know that's a quote by some famous investor. And, they, and they'll look back and they'll say, go look at the previous market cap of Bannerman in 2007. And then they compare Bannerman today. And I'm like, market cap is a metric. And I understand it has some value as a metric, but you don't value the company based off of price. The pricing of it, which is market cap, market cap is a, is a pricing of the company. It's the total value or pricing of that company. But Bannerman in 2007, isn't necessarily the Bannerman of today. They're two separate companies that you should be valuing. They've got far different pounds. Uh, that are valued in the ground. They have, they know what they have now and they didn't know what they had back then. So which one should be more valuable? The thing that you know that you have or the thing that you don't know that you have? And, and you know, may, that's debatable, whatever. But, um, you know, be careful how you're valuing things because market cap, and I understand it has some value to it. I know I said on Twitter that it has no value. It has no value in valuing the company. It is the overall market price of that company, what people are paying for it at the today's price, but it doesn't mean that's the underlying fundamental value of that company. And that's where it gets dangerous. So when someone says, this is the peak, we should at least go around that peak. Well, that's great, but what if you've got 10 times the money supply in there? You, you should go 10 times the, the, the peak then if the valuations were the same. That's That's all I'm saying. 
you have to you have to take out all this money supply and as the money supply keeps diving you know dumping into these assets people are going to get confused they're going to get confused because the price is going to go up but their value is going to get eaten away uh if if your stock if your dow is ten thousand i'm just going to make up a number the dow is ten thousand and the food price is one dollar so it's like ten to one right ten thousand to one the dow price goes up uh to twenty thousand it doubles but your food price goes up 10x you can buy less food you've lost your purchasing power you've done exactly what you didn't want to do you didn't invest to increase your purchasing power of food and and buying fuel and whatever you've lost purchasing power you've become poorer and 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 that's where i think people don't understand is it's like you can make dollar value gains and become poorer in this next i think leg and and that's something that i that i really highly watch so i'm 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 looking at things of how can i increase my purchasing power of other things and when you find those assets that just beat up on ev absolutely everything else that is when you you know like what it is what it's like to make big purchasing power gains because it, it just changes your entire portfolio it changes your life to some extent because now you can afford things that you were like man this was tight before but now this is totally different but it takes time it takes time it's sometimes it happens overnight sometimes it doesn't and you know they're they're obviously gonna <laughs> they're gonna tax you either way even if you make money if you make money they tax you if you make massive purchasing power gains they'll, they'll tax you there too but um yeah that's that's when i noticed like when you get this stuff right in the ratios uh you see some big moves and i've seen that in oil in my own portfolio especially some huge gains in oil so i i think the uh the logic is solid on the ratio investment now we're just arguing if the market conditions are still ripe for a big move. I mean, that's that's what everybody argues right now. Are we going to get a crash? Are we going to get a deflation? Is it going to be, you know, all that stuff? So. Hi. <laughs> so what, what else do you have there, Scott? Got anything else? No, nothing else, Andy. Nothing else. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much, anything else either. But, um. That's uh that's what we've got. Thanks for coming on, Scott. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And... Can I can I just quickly share yeah, a Bible yeah. verse? Go for it. <clears throat> Very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I think um these couple of weeks I've been really busy with work and um I haven't gotten a lot of rest. <laughs> and so I think this one's really good. Um and he said, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So God really wants us to rest as well. So if you're not resting, if you're not getting enough sleep, please um take a good rest and have a good sleep and um, look after yourself. Mm. That's it. Hi to everybody, Will. You say hi, hi. <laughs> I've got my kid here. He wants to join in. So um, that's what we've got for today, guys. Uh, thank you, Scott, for coming on from Sow and Reap Capital. Uh, this guy's name is Willie. <laughs> Little Willie. And... Um, Hopefully you guys, don't forget to click thumb up. Don't forget to click subscribe. And uh, if you guys want to check out the website, you can check out this guy here. Or you can check out uh, his website or YouTube channel, Sow and Reap Capital. All right, guys. We'll catch you later. Thanks for coming on, Scott. Thank we'll you see you next time. See you later. Bye. <laughs>